Turn in your Bibles this morning to 1 John chapter 3. I want to go ahead and give you, since it's been a couple of weeks since we've been in 1 John here, I want to give you a brief summary of what we have already heard from John. John has written this letter addressing the need to stay filled with joy. Uh, and joy comes, as we've learned, from an intimate fellowship with the Lord. Uh, and other believers. He tells us how the reason why people lose their joy, oh yeah, the junior high, middle, middle schoolers. Thank you, Larry, for flagging me down there. Don't ever be afraid to do that. You know, I'm forgetful sometimes. Not very often. <laughs> you guys have a blessed time with uh, Larry as he brings you the Word of God and helps you learn about Jesus. <laughs> There's a bunch of them, aren't there? <laughs> Uh, great. But anyways, he tells uh, of how the reason people lose joy is that they've lost this intimacy with God due to some sin that they've been covering up. Uh, and he says that there's no need for that. Be honest about your sin and confess your sin because he is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And then that's because he is our advocate and he's the propitiation for us. And that means he took our place on the cross, took our punishment for sin for us. And so that we could have fellowship with God. So we need not, you know, hold back from being honest about our sin, confessing it to God. Uh, somebody mentioned that in the prayer time this morning, how wonderful it is to be able to repent and confess and know that God is forgiven. Uh, the prescription for this is to do that and uh, knowing that he is, is going to listen and he is going to restore our fellowship. Now, when we are honest about our sins and receive cleansing, we are then empowered by the inner fellowship we have with God through the Holy Spirit to stop sinning and to walk in obedience uh, to the Lord. And that was the second purpose that John gave this letter. He said, I'm writing to you that you will, know, will, will not keep sinning. Uh, because every time you see we understand that we can go to God for forgiveness, that seems to strengthen uh, the presence of God within us to uh, help us overcome the sin that we've given ourselves to. The false doctrine of Gnosticism... Uh, was infiltrating the churches, and these false teachers did not believe that Jesus was both fully God and fully man. Uh, these guys believe that what a person does with his or her body uh, is of no consequence because the body is not what God's concerned about. He's only concerned about the spirit. And so uh, they, they thought it was okay to con continue, for instance, in sexual immorality and anything else that indulges the flesh because it has no bearing on a person's spiritual walk with God. And so that false doctrine was an invitation, you see, to do exactly the opposite of what John is writing about. It's an invitation to keep on sinning. Uh, and so, especially in sexual immorality. Now, this is consistent with the lawless, antichrist spirit in the world. John pointed out that rather than to conform to the truth that was taught by the apostles and the, the power of the gospel, uh, that these guys decided to leave the body of Christ, to go their own way. And John pointed out that that's an in indication, of course, that they really were never there with their hearts. They were no, really not a part of the body or part of the church. And so uh, they had left. In chapter 3, John wrote of how amazing it is that God loves us so much that he calls us his children. And he also has given us his, the spiritual gift of love to love one another as he has loved us. Now, two weeks ago, we saw that John was apparently telling these Christians that the false teachers and their followers would wind up hating them uh, after they left. And like Cain had hated Abel. And Cain hated Abel, who was at his best and had done nothing to him. And yet he hated him. But God loved Cain so much that he gave him the opportunity to redo the sacrifice that had been rejected and to repent. But Cain, rather than repent, became more and more hateful toward his brother, and he killed Abel. But believers are called not to hate, but to love. And, and so true believers will be known for their love toward one another, and those who hate are not of Christ. Calvin Miller, in his book, The Taste of Joy, uh, wrote, Christians state glibly that they love the whole world, while they permit themselves animosities, within their immediate world. World love is a philosophical credo, but loving the world at large can only be done by loving face-to-face -face the world 
that is not so distant. And so it's more challenging to do that. We can say we love the world all day long, but boy, when we have to love somebody unlovely that's close to us, that's a bigger challenge, isn't it? It takes the love of God to do that. There is a Peanuts cartoon with Lucy saying to Charlie Brown, I hate everything. I hate everybody. I hate the whole wide world. And Charlie says, but I thought you had inner peace. Lucy replies, I do have inner peace, but I still ha have outer obnoxiousness. <laughs> now the truth is, <laughs> the truth is that inner, real inner peace with God will cause hatred and obnoxiousness to crack and break away from the external world we live in. And so that we can love the, those around us. Now, the love that God gives is a very special kind of love that chooses for the highest good of others regardless of attraction or regardless of friendship. This is the kind of love that God had for us, and so much so that he gave his son to die for our sins, and this is where we pick things up in 1 John chapter 3. 1 John 3.16, by this we know love because he laid down his life for us, and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Now, in Romans 5, uh, Paul tells how Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. We were not attractive to him, we were not friends to him, but he chose to love us even in our sin. While we were at our worst, he chose to love us. Now, how easy is it to love someone who is at his or her worst? Think about it. Uh, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, though, in the name of Christ, we can do it. I tell young couples that I'm doing pre-marriage counseling with, I tell them, you know, uh, I mean, they're all giddy with, with love, right? You know, and they've been having a lot of romantic feelings toward one another. I said, you know, but when you live together in marriage, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, you're going to see each other at your best. That's what you're primarily seeing right now, you know. And you're going to see each other at your worst. But you need to still love each other. That's why you're going to need this agape, the love of God, that is choosing for the highest good of another regardless of what's going on with them. Uh, so you lead the way in that kind of love. And this is what we are to do in the body of Christ. Jesus laid down his life for dying in our place for our sins. He laid down his life for us. So how then are we to lay down our lives for one another? As the verse says here, we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Now, there's an interesting insight that John Stott, a, a great pastor and teacher and writer, had on this phrase, laid down and uh, lay down your li our lives. It seems to imply, he says, not so much the laying down as the laying aside of something like clothes. It is, in fact, used in John 13, 4, of Christ taking off, the same expression, of Christ taking off his outer garment. Now, when Jesus laid aside his garment, what was he going to do when he did that? Tell me, what was he doing? He was going to wash the disciples' feet when he laid aside his garment. Uh, and he told them to do the same thing for one another as he had been an example of them to serve one another. The servant who washed the feet of those in the household when they came in from the dirty streets uh, was usually the lowest servant in the household. That was his job, or her job, to wash people's feet. That was the lowest job possible in the household. And so Jesus took the form of a lowly servant with those disciples. And that's what we are called to do as well, to lay aside a lot of things in order, if there's a need that our brother or sister has, to be willing to fulfill that need on their behalf, even if it's something that somebody else we think, somebody ought to be doing something about this. You know, I can think of a few people who ought to do it. You know, somebody who's a little lower than I am in the established order of things, you know, the hierarchy of leadership or whatever. But no, all of us are called to take on that low role, you know, that the form of, of lowliness uh, with one another. So John tells us one way we can walk out this love for other believers. In verse 17, 
But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? Now, listen to this description of the early believers not long after they were filled with the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 4, verse 33, at the end of that verse 33, it says, And great grace was upon them all, nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them, and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold, and laid them, there's that word laid again, okay, laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each one as anyone had need. So this great generosity that people had there in the early church, that was because of the Holy Spirit. They were not naturally that way, okay? They were just as selfish as anybody else until the Holy Spirit entered their lives and changed their view of things. So the Holy Spirit turns people who are self-absorbed into selfless, other-centered, generous people. And Paul wrote in Romans 5 that the Holy Spirit pours out the love of God into our hearts. So when we say we're, we're spirit-filled, what are we filled with? We're filled with the love of God. That's what we're filled with. And so that's what emerges then is the fruit of the Spirit. The evidence of the Spirit-filled life is love. Now, when this lengthy recession that we have been in for the last few years began, quite a few people in our fellowship lost their jobs. Uh, and I watched as you, you guys stepped to the plate and gave out of your own resources to help those families. And the, even now that, uh, you know, uh, I see that, I don't know who you are, but when I get the report of the deposit uh, you know, during the middle of the week, I see that there are still people who are giving above their regular giving for benevolence purposes. And we do still have people in the body who are in need. So it's a wonderful thing that we stepped up and we, we keep giving for those in need. Now, in verse 18, John continues to write, My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. So we all know that it's, it is easy to say that we love someone. We can say that, you know. But doing it is another story sometimes. It's a little more of a, it stretches us to actually carry that out. I heard a well-known pastor say that there was this guy every Sunday uh, when, you know, that they met for church. Uh, every Sunday he would say to this pastor, I love you, pastor. Then he said he would hear reports all week long how the guy was stabbing him in the back, you know. And so, like, okay, <laughs> you say you love, but you're doing exactly the opposite thing. Uh, sometimes it is a bigger challenge to love people with whom we are familiar because we see so much about them, don't we? Again, the best and the worst. We see the good, the bad, and the ugly, and it's easy to say we love the world instead. John Stock commented again. He said, loving everybody in general may be an excuse for loving nobody in particular. Well, that's a profound statement, isn't it? Uh, it's convicting. From 1986 to 1990, Frank Reed was held, host held hostage in a Lebanon cell. For months at a time, he was blindfolded, living in complete darkness, or chained to a wall and kept in absolute silence. Think about that. On one occasion, he was moved to another room, and although blindfolded, he could sense that there were others in the room, yet it was three weeks before he was able to see enough out of his blindfold to discover that he was chained next to two close friends, Terry Anderson and Tom Sutherland, who did care about him and he for them, but he didn't know they were even there. Although he was beaten, made ill, and tormented, Reed felt most the lack of someone, someone caring. He said in an interview with Time, nothing I did mattered to anyone. I began to realize how withering it is to exist with not a single expression of caring around me. I learned one overriding fact, caring is a powerful force. If no one cares, you are truly alone. 
Now, most of the time, when we are not loving people with our actions, it is because we really are not seeing them. It's almost as if they're not there, right? Or we're not feeling the emotions that would say, that would bring us to say, well, I really love you and care about you. By the way, I'm going to be praying for you, you know. By the way, if you say that, you need to pray. Let's not make that a cliche. In fact, I'd encourage you, if you're talking to someone face to face, to pray for them in that, at that moment. Don't say, well, I'll see you, I'll, I'll be praying for you, you know. <laughs> but say, can we pray right now? I'd like to pray for you. You know, we perhaps, like Frank Reed, are so blindfolded by our own problems sometimes that we cannot see how others are close by us to really care for us. And we close ourselves in, and one of the biggest things, the most often things that happens when people are in crisis is that they isolate. And they, they stop showing up around others. And sometimes we need to see that there are people all around us who do care. Now, the love that John writes about is not based on feelings. Too often we are, are waiting for someone to stir up our emotions and our sympathies. I spoke to, I, I used to know pretty well a guy who was a professional fundraiser for uh, charitable organizations and some very big ones. Uh, and I asked him, I said, well, why do people give when, when in your work? And he said, it's all, she said, Jerry, it's all about emotion. We have to make a presentation that stirs everybody's emotions. And that's why people give. It's when they're emotionally stirred. But you see, this love, though emotions may be attached to it, is not an emotional thing. It is the choice to do the right thing, no matter who that other person is or what their need is. We can make that choice. God has graced us with abilities and talents to serve others, and it might be through the gift of mercy or the gift of encouragement or through teaching or taking care of our facilities or serving in children's ministry or preparing a meal uh, after someone's had surgery. Sometimes we, you know, saying we love someone may not be supported by actions. God backed up his love through the giving of his son, and we are to back up our words with our service and care for one another. I'm so excited about the response that we're getting for the Stephen ministry. Uh, we're getting a number of applications of people that want to go through the classes, and the fact that there are brothers and sisters who are ready to be equipped to be caregivers, you know, that pleases the Lord. Okay? This is love in action. Giving attention to those who pour out their hearts in grief, listening and praying with those who are overwhelmed by some crisis, this is love in action. It's not just saying, well, I'll be praying for you, I love you. It's that, you know, I'm going to love you in a way that you can tell I love you, you know. This is love. Verse 19 and by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. Now the love we choose to give one another is the evidence that we are of the truth. It is the fruit that is born by being committed to Christ. It is true evidence of the spirit-filled life. Love is what gives an amazing sense also of assurance, John says, in our hearts that Christ lives within us by his spirit. Now what does that mean? You know, I know that I'm a, you know, a pretty selfish old dude, you know. So did I say dude? Uh, but I, I'm a pretty selfish guy without Jesus. And you might not even like me that much without Jesus, you know. But he makes that kind of difference in me to where, you know, I know that something good has happened in my heart. That I am assured, yes, I do belong to Jesus because I sure wouldn't be acting like this without him. You see that? It gives assurance. When we love people, it gives us assurance that we are of the truth. Gil Irwin tells a great story about a man he knew when he was a boy. The man's name was Jake. 
and he was the meanest, drunkest man in town. And he would come to church from time to time to beat up the elders. One Wednesday night, Jake came to church, but not to beat anybody up. And remarkably, Jake, at the end of the service, gave his heart to Christ. And he walked down the aisle of the little church and kneeled down at the altar. And the next night, there was another meeting at the church, and the pastor asked if anyone wanted to share what God was doing in them. And Jake stood up and said, I have something to say. Last night when I came here, I hated you people. Heads nodded in agreement. They knew he hated them. But something happened to me, and I don't understand this, but tonight I love you. Wow. <laughs> Makes all the difference in the world. Christ was loving those people through him. He loves through us. We're his voice, his ears, his hands, and his feet. We are the body of Christ. Paul described how this love works in Ephesians 4.15. At the end of that verse, it says, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Yeah. Between the shoulder... And the elbow of the human arm is one large bone, and below the elbow to the wrist uh, are two smaller bones. Now, these bones are able to function and are useful only when they are attached together by ligaments. And that's what Paul is referring to. You see, those bones, if they didn't have any ligaments, would be worthless. It would be just like that, you know, nothing but skin and nothing, you know. You know. Useless. But because they're ligaments, that arm can work in a, in, a, in a great way, you know, a powerful way. Loving choices to love, accept, and forgive one another are the ligaments that cause a local fellowship of believers to be unified and to be spiritually healthy. Verse 20, for if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and shows all thing, knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God. Now, assurance that we are loved children of God is something we struggle with at times, isn't it? Uh, it is hard to accept God's love and graciousness because we are familiar with who we used to be. And that song, I Am Redeemed, boy, what a powerful song. Because it just really showed all of that and. the... Uh, it just fits so well with this, this message this morning. Uh, you know, and we know that we are not yet perfect. Uh, I'm reminded of that every day. And other people are reminded of it from day to, <laughs> day, to day too. Uh, especially when we mess up, we wonder if we are even saved. You know, a saved person wouldn't do that, would they? You know? And we wonder, you know, am I really saved? Or, you know, you feel... You know, like something's not right. God forgives, but we struggle to forgive ourselves within the context of his grace. We go to God and say, well, you know, I messed up. You know, you know back when I messed up. And God said, well, you, you know, didn't you ask forgiveness? Yeah. Well, I forgave you. And I don't even remember it, by the way. <laughs> uh, in Scripture, the heart is the seat of of emotions and thoughts. It is where we experience either feelings of assurance or feelings of condemnation. It includes what we call the conscience. There are those of us whose hearts condemn us so that we never seem to be to feel completely loved and accepted by God. There's a feeling of permanently being on probation with God. That anything short of perfection will send us to jail or to hell. As Jesus was dying, he gasped out the words, it is finished. Now, what does finished mean? You know, referring to the atonement for our sins. But what a lot of us keep hearing is that, it, that, that atonement, it's still up in the air. You know, we're just not absolutely sure that it's finished. Then there's false, false guilt from an overbearing self-critical conscience. My dad suffered from this as a young pastor, and whatever he did was not good enough to please God. Uh, anything short of outstanding numbers of converts and 
and a dynamic, visible move of God's Spirit in all the services where he's preaching and, you know, just a dramatic visitation and move of God kind of thing, you know. If that didn't happen, he just felt like a failure. And that uh, he felt severe self-condemnation. But in the year 2000, he almost died from a runaway bacterial infection which was resistant to antibiotics. So I made a bunch of short trips to Missouri. One day I asked him to tell me something important that he had learned about God. And he said, I have learned that a lot of things that I felt so guilty about were not wrong at all. Meaning that the condemnation he felt so often was false condemnation, false guilt. He realized that he was being a lot harder on himself than God was. There are some of you who could say the same thing, I bet. God's love, acceptance, and forgiveness, his grace is greater than our feelings of condemnation. Just where does false condemnation come from? It does not come from God. Uh, in Romans chapter 8, uh, Paul wrote, Who is he who condemns? Is it Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us? No, it's not God. The scripture tells us that Satan is the accuser of the brethren. In Revelation 12.10, Now I heard a loud voice saying in the heaven, Now salvation, strength, and, and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ has come for the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before God day and night has been cast down. God is greater than the accusations of Satan. It may come from legalism. Some people have grown up in a very legalistic church or home. My dad felt, guilt, felt guilty wearing a short sleeve shirt because he was taught that it was a sin. Uh, I think I told you how he sneaked off and went to a Disney movie. His church told him he had lost his salvation and he had to be baptized over again. One friend played Little League Baseball and his grandfather would not allow him on his property while, while wearing his uniform. God is greater than the condemnation of legalism. It might come from people who want us to be just like them, do things their way, as if they own us. and We are deemed unacceptable unless we bend to their personal convictions. Uh, they are sometimes covertly aggressive manipulators who heap false guilt on people. God is greater than unreal expectations from others. I have known people who felt condemned because they did not feel anything during a worship service. There must be something wrong with me. Well, we felt a lot of things, a lot during the worship service today. But if we have a Sunday where we don't feel much of anything, does that mean we're all cast out or condemned? Why no? We choose to worship God, not based on our feelings, but based upon what Christ has done for us. Many years ago, a friend of mine and I did a late night call-in show, radio show at WLAC from like 8.30 to 11.30 on Sunday night. And uh, we received a call from a woman just after her church service and she had to endure a long, drawn-out uh, invitation designed to get people up to the front. I know there's somebody that needs to come up here. You know, all this kind of stuff. And, and sometimes God is speaking to people during those kinds of times. But in this case, she was a hypersensitive person, and she waited and waited. And she said, well, I guess I better go up there. You know. She was all torn up when she got home, and I asked her, I said, do you know of anything that stands between you and God? Any sin going on in your life? She said, I know of nothing. I said, then be free. Praise the Lord. You know, that was some other thing other than God asking you to go forward and repent. Others feel condemned because they keep ruminating over past failure. God is greater than our past. Yet others feel condemned because other people refuse them forgiveness. God is bigger than the critical spirit and unforgiving condemnation of others. 
with people who know our history, listen, people who have known us at our worst, we may keep paying today for failures that happened long ago. Others feel condemned because of being tempted to sin. Well, if I'm tempted, I must not be right. Temptation is not a sin. It's what we do with the temptation that matters. God is greater than our temptations and provides a way of escape. When we receive the Spirit of Christ, part of the renewing of our minds is that our conscience begins to be renewed too. We begin to be able to discern what matters to God. Verse 22, in whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. You know, again, we've seen this over and over in 1 John. John is repeating something he heard Jesus say. That is that prayers being answered are contingent on our willingness to keep the commandments and to do what pleases God. Jesus said that. What pleases God is what? That we love others as he has loved us. Loving God and loving our neighbors, loving one another as Christ has loved us, that's the greatest commandments of all. And guess what? If we are doing those two commandments, loving God, loving our neighbors as ourselves, as we've been loved, all the other commandments are going to fall into place because they're subject to those two. Does that make sense? To withhold love or mistreat a brother or sister in Christ will hinder, listen, it will hinder our prayers. Peter warned husbands that mistreating their wives would hinder their prayers. He noted that their wives are fellow or equal heirs of the grace of God not some second-class person. This applies to all of our relationships in the body of Christ. We are loved to love one another as fellow heirs of the grace of God. Paul even exhorted that we treat one another as if the other is more important than ourselves. Uh, I, I love this. You know, I, I spot some of the cars in our congregation because when Gail Urban was here, he gave out these stickers that say other on them, you know. And I go, oh, that's somebody that goes to our church, I bet, you know. And sure enough, I'll come up beside them and, yeah, hey, how you doing, you know. Other. It's a powerful thing to treat others as if more important than ourselves. Verse 23, and this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. So here we now see the commandment of which John is writing. This verse seems related to the previous verse about effective prayer. Again, this is an echo of what Jesus said about praying in his name, right? And praying while keeping his commandments. Both of those things, whatever you pray in my name, you shall have. You know. So praying in his name. Now, to pray at the end, to say at the end of a prayer, in Jesus' name, amen. Has that become a cliche for some of us? You know, it's like, well, you know, Jesus said to pray in his name, so in the name of Jesus, amen. Yeah. Well, let me tell you what that means. It is not some formula for effective prayer. It is a confession of faith that Jesus Christ is Lord over everything. It is a confession of faith that he has given us access to the Father in prayer through his death on the cross for the atonement of sins. It is a confession of faith that he rose again and is the advocate on our behalf before the Father. And so that's why we pray in his name. Because he's standing there before the Father as our advocate now, he's passing that prayer on to God the Father <laughs> on our behalf. This morning, I hope you really know how much God loves us. 
He loves us so much that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, and he laid down his life for us. Because we are loved and accepted and forgiven by God, we are now free to love as he has loved us. We are free to do as Christ has done when he laid aside his outer garment and he took a basin of water and a towel and he began to wash the disciples' feet. The role of an humble servant. There is always a proverbial foot washing to be done for someone. To elevate one another as if more important than ourselves, we love one another as he has loved us. This is his commandment. This is what pleases God, to love one another. Now some today may be slow to embrace God's love and grace. Self-condemnation has settled into someone's heart or the condemnation that someone else is heaping on them, on you. I want you to know there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. That's because he did everything necessary so that the sentence of condemnation of death would not have to be passed on us. Praise God, I am redeemed, as the song said. I'd like for us to stand. The worship team's going to come back, and we're going to sing that song again. That'll just uh, come on up here. I want you to, to make that your confession today. If you're burdened down, if you're burdened down this morning with condemnation, the Holy Spirit convicts us, reproves us of sin, but never condemns us, okay? There's a difference. But if condemnation's going on and the accuser of the brethren is after you and taunting you, or your past is hanging over you, remember the words of this song, I am redeemed, and the shame is something you don't have to hold on to anymore. Let it go. Let it go. Be free. Praise the Lord. Let's sing this together. Seems like all I could see was the struggle Haunted by the ghost that lived in my past Bound up shackled Child, lift up your hands. I 
song will resonate in our hearts all week long. We are redeemed by the grace of God, not by our own works, by what He has done for us. And so as we say, Lord, we're grateful and thankful for what you've done for us, we don't want to keep on sinning. We want to have a, a life that is a testimony of grace and of thanksgiving and gratitude to you for what you have done. Thank you, Lord, that you are bigger than our hearts, that our hearts are not, we wor not what we worship, it's not what we bow to, but you are the one. You are the one. And so we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that you would empower us, Lord, to live a godly life, and to love one another. In Christ's name, amen.